Professor Sami Acer uh, from the University of King Saud. Um, you've been working with the PBL in different uh, environments and have great expertise in the area. Um, what would you say differentiates PBL from a more traditional way of learning? I think uh, problem-based learning is providing students with a very good opportunity to discuss what they understand about what they know. And not only that, but to discover areas that they don't know and gaps in their knowledge. And this will help them to think about what they are doing in the tutorials, share ideas, why they agree with that or what is the possible uh, alternatives. That means they debate issues. If they don't know and they feel there is uh, still a need for more knowledge in that area, they will put that as their learning issues and they will go and search for knowledge and come back to discuss it again. This is called active learning where the students have the opportunities to think, to make decisions, and also generate hypotheses for the problems they found, and try to find more answers for their to, re to, to, to refine these hypotheses. And that's through the history or through the examination. And as they refine their hypotheses, they can make decisions or think about investigations that they need and how to interpret these uh, investigation results and then how to develop a management plan. I think all these co-cognitive skills that are embedded in problem-based learning, you cannot present it in lectures on its own because lectures on its own is mainly focused about uh, factual knowledge. And there is no opportunity, even if you try to, to modify the lectures to improve or to ask questions in the middle, it is uh, still led by the teacher and very little opportunity for students to interact. So um, if you would summarize the skills that a student uh, who reads a PBL curriculum uh, needs to, to develop and, and thrive, um, how would you summarize these skills? There is a wide range of uh, skills uh, needed in problem-based learning. And students develop these uh, skills gradually. I can say these uh, skills can be grouped into two categories. The first category I will call co-cognitive skills. The second category I will call it non-co-cognitive skills. Under co-cognitive skills, I think the students need to understand how when they read a trigger, which is a starting point in the case, how they identify problems and key information. Then how can they think and discuss uh, what we call brainstorming about the hypothesis or possible causes for every problem? For example, for they found a problem like vomiting. So what are the possible causes? And they have the age of the patient and the gender of the patient. So depending on that, their hypothesis should be around that. Then they can go to the other problem and the third problem then they can go and say, if the patient is here, what question I will ask? And they come with uh, possible questions. The aim of questions at that stage is to ask questions that will make a hypothesis less likely, most likely, or can be excluded. Uh, then another uh, students will read the history and they will get the information from the history. Then they try to use the information from the history to refine their hypothesis and re-rank them. Maybe some of them will be excluded in the basis of the history. Then uh, they will go into a stage where they will ask, if the patient is here and I would like to examine him on the basis of refining my hypothesis, which body system should I start and what are the uh, vital signs I need to check? Then they will get the examination and they do the same. They wanted to drag the knowledge, important positive and negative aspects that they received in the examination and place it back to the hypothesis to refine their hypothesis more. During that process, students will discover that they don't know 
few things uh, or important things about the case. So they will put that as learning issues and they will go and search for knowledge and they come back in the tutorial number two, usually at the end of the week, to present their findings and try to discuss it as a group and then they continue with the other parts of the case. So the case is like a story and through that the case is driving learning particularly in the early years driving learning about basic sciences in a clinical format and in an integrated way. Students can develop mechanism also summarizing the whole case and looking at biopsychosocial issues also in the problem together with basic sciences from anatomy, physiology, pathology, pharmacology, microbiology if there is any in the case and put this together to know about the case in a meaningful way. Not just the diagnosis, the aim is not the diagnosis, the, the, the aim is learning through the case. The second component which is a non-cognitive component, that includes how they work together as a team. So this includes accountability for example in the group. If they are going to do something, they have to be accountable and do it. Coming on time in the tutorials, showing respect to others, taking roles and sharing responsibilities in the group, working effectively in a collaborative way. All these non-cognitive skills actually can be important for them as they develop it and then they go to the hospital system and that's what we need. We need doctors who have these professional attitudes that can work uh, with other members and other colleagues uh, effectively. Many students uh, find an uncertainty when beginning uh, studying PBL and uh, adapting to the active learning. Um, do you have any tips for these students of how do they find their path on learning? Um, it is uh, definitely is challenging to the students in the early weeks when they come from high schools and join the university and they find that the system is different than they used to have in high school. Um, I think students will vary about how they face these challenges and they w how to work out. However, there are some students who find this very challenging and they feel that they are unable to cope. Now the faculty has a responsibility to provide programs for training students on these skills. Why not? So how can I identify problems? How can I generate hypotheses? How can I debate issues? How can I search a textbook? How can I search for knowledge uh, on PubMed? Uh, or other resources. How can I read an article? How can I read a review paper? Uh, how can I construct knowledge from several resources and uh, present it? How can I be a scribe, a an effective scribe, who the person who write on the whiteboard? How can I use the uh, dictionary during the medical dictionary during the tutorial and find the meaning of a word and say it to the other members in the group so that we can progress. How can I, uh, I, I share responsibilities with others? How can I be a member of a team? I think all these uh, skills can be done through training workshops, not to be uh, the whole day. I would say uh, two hours uh, in one day and then have a task that the students work on it and then another session two hours and then so on. It can be four sessions, every session two hours long and over say two months. I'm pretty sure from my experience and I have implemented this when I was a professor of medical education in uh, University Technology Mara in Malaysia that it will help the students and I published a paper about that. I was thinking about the role of the tutor um, which uh, might also be a new experience for, for students coming from high school. Um, what would you say the role of the tutor or facilitator is uh, in the group? The tutor, as you stated, he is a facilitator. And a facilitator is a, a word originally from French and Latin, which means to the ability to make the things more easily to understand. 
to help in the process of understanding. That role is new to many tutors who used to be a traditional teacher who will give lectures, but they don't know how to facilitate uh, the discussion. Uh, I think, it, again, it is the responsibility of the medical education departments or units or the college to prepare training, adequate training workshops uh, that show the tutors how to do it. It's not the theory about problem-based learning or the theory about facilitation, but about hands-on training with students on how to facilitate the process. And as I said in the morning, it should be also followed by uh, other sessions that respond to the needs of the tutors and any challenges they are facing on how to solve it. Uh, also, the college can provide advanced facilitation programs that help tutors who have been doing problem-based learning and would like to move to a higher stage of uh, facilitation and doing the job in a, good, uh, in a good way. But I think that tutors need first to believe in problem-based learning as a teaching and learning method. They have the desire to improve their skills and take it as a responsibility to do it with passion and love. The more we love what we are doing, the more we will do it better. And if we hate what we are doing, definitely the training will not help at all. Um, the uh, assessment, uh, which is an uh, important part of the uh, education, of course, um, how uh, does a PBL uh, assessment reflect the process of, of active learning? I think, as I said earlier, that the two main aims of problem-based learning are co-cognitive skills and non-co-cognitive skills. The assessment tools must come with a way that address the two components. Address the co-cognitive components, address the non-cognitive components. One of the ways, even in the literature, and we used it in the University of Melbourne and the other universities, is to um, uh, have interview with the students. And the form that we use for these interviews is a standardized form addressing the two components, the co-cognitive and non-cognitive. And so the students know about the form. And they know very early because we give a copy in the student book. And then the students can come to interview after two cases or three cases with the tutor. And the tutor trained on how to give feedback, constructive feedback to the students. And through that process, the students can learn how they are doing in the different components of co-cognitive and also non-co-cognitive. We use what we call Socrates method in uh, giving feedback. And Socrates method means that the tutor is asking questions, like how do you feel you are doing in PPL? What are the areas you are excelling in? How, how, uh, what are the things that you feel that you need to work more on? How do you feel about our group? Right. What's stopping you from achieving what you want to achieve? How can I help you? what we can do together to improve your performance. This, so you see the tutor is not judging the students. The tutor is building trust with the students and helping them to talk. And through that, which we call it Socrates way of giving feedback, the students will have more ability to be open to the teacher and talk. And here the teacher can help. The other way of assessment could be written, what we call it problem-based learning style of questions. So the, that examination could be for two hours, three hours, and you have uh, multiple cases, just brief cases, and maybe the question aim at testing the ability to generate hypotheses. Maybe another question is about the ability to construct a mechanism. Another question with a, a scenario may be, about the ability to interpret laboratory findings, whether uh, biochemical tests or pathology tests, something like that. So you have objectives for every question, 
and you have a wide range of scenarios, maybe six or seven scenarios, uh, not necessary to be the same scenarios that are in the PPL, but maybe closer to them. Uh, we uh, experience a problem in, in the, at the psychology program uh, uh, that uh, some students are uh, skipping in the brain processing process uh, uh, when uh, generating hypothesis. Um, what would you say to students who uh, skip this process? Uh, why should they uh, do this brainstorming? and generate hypothesis. Yeah. I think very important as the tutor start the uh, first tutorial with the students to ask what are our ground rules. And as I usually make stress in my papers and in my book, Navigating Problem-Based Learning, um, the starting with the ground rules means it's coming from the students that we will follow the system in the cases we are coming here on time, for example. Uh, we will try to work on the cases together as a team. Now, as they identify the problems, students need to understand that in the scientific way of thinking, and what we do on a day-to-day -day practice is we face problems. Anyone in his work, what he's doing is facing a problem and try to solve these problems. But how to solve these problems? you need to generate possible causes. So the hypotheses are vital. I mean, the police, for example, when they have a crime and they will go to the scene, they have to say, what's the problem in that? And then what are the possible causes? Uh, electrician will have, for example, the light is turned off all of a sudden. He will come to solve the problem. He must say, is the problem in the switch? Is the problem in the main switch? Is the problem in the whole building? Is the problem is beyond that building? So the hypothesis, everyone with us, in order to solve an issue, you must start with hypothesis. And through this hypothesis, you need to test every hypothesis to see which one is the most likely, which one is the least likely, which one can be excluded. And through that systematic approach, we reach to our diagnosis. Well, if we don't have that scientific way of thinking, we will never reach to our uh, uh, diagnosis and our effectiveness uh, in, a, in, a, in the right way. So the hypotheses are very important and it is the basis of the scientific way of thinking and also it allow us not to uh, focus on a specific aspects and miss the others, but to be start very broadly to see all the possible causes and then gradually try to search for knowledge to help in excluding some of them. So it is very vital. The teachers should explain why hypotheses are important, maybe in a lecture before the start of um, the problem-based learning program, and give examples, like simple examples like I mentioned, about how this can help us in the thinking processes. Since uh, PBL is very uh, centered on uh, group uh, learning and, and group functioning, um, how can you tackle a dysfunctional group from both a student perspective or what can a student do and as a tutor? Yep. Uh, handling dysfunctional group is very important to have ground rules. Because ground rules, when you start with it, and it's coming from the students and they agreed on it, when problems, minor problems happen, you can remind the group about ground rules. For example, if you find two are coming late, half an hour late, you might say, do you remember that we agreed that we will be here, all of us, on time? You see, ground rules here will be more uh, eff effective and also will not be targeting a particular person but it is for all of us. And definitely ground rules also apply on the tutor. So if the tutor and the group agreed everyone in time, the tutor should be on time also. If the problem is higher than the ground rules and you tried to use the ground rules, but the same problem is happening in the group again and again, maybe, and that students may be a particular student who is uh, not helping the group, uh, is always delaying the discussion or offending others or dominating the discussion. Here you need in the feedback 
as I said in the interview session, to raise these issues with him. Or if it is happened twice before the time of the feedback, you might ask him to come to the room. I will ask him to come to my room and I will talk about my concern. Uh, the aim is to help him to replace bad habits with good habits and understand that in PPL we do not or in the culture and the environment we have in the health sciences or in psychology, we need people to collaborate with each other, to respect each other, to work with. If you take that message and you see change, that's okay. But maybe it will repeat again. And maybe the thing's more serious. Now here, we usually ask him to see the DBT dean because it is very serious now. And maybe the problem is not just uh, spoiling the group, but maybe more than that. Things like uh, physical abuse of another student, or verbal abuse of another student, or something that unacceptable by the laws of the university. Now again, this will go into that stage, but de definitely at that stage, the problem now reached at the level of the dean or the vice dean. If the problem is more serious, suppose it is a police case, now this has to be reported to the uh, president of the university to make appropriate decision because it could be a very big problem. So these are the four levels of dysfunction and the four actions that should be de uh, done uh, towards every uh, level according to that.